Now, when you cut chicken for stew, I will remove that wishbone. You have here. We'll remove this. And now to separate the chicken, one of the mistakes is to try to cut here. Use the weight of the chicken. I, for example, have the weight of the chicken here. If I cut with the point of a knife, look what happened. That's it. You know, there is nothing really holding it, except in the back now, that little thing that we call the oyster here. So I will go with my knife and cut that oyster. Now to open the leg, one of the mistakes is to extend the leg too much and it's hard to open. You have to bring that bone parallel to the carcass, grab it at the knee, and then it will crack open easily. You cut through the sinew, there is a large sinew here, you pull out, and that's it. The other leg, again, cut this way, oyster, bring it back to cut it at the, st at the, at the sinew, and pull out. Now I have the whole breast, which is very large. If I want to separate it in two, I have to cut around the sternum here, which is the central bone. On one side, actually, and on the other side, here it is, this side and this side. I will put the chicken on its side. I know that there is an articulation right there, so I will go into that articulation here with my knife. If I don't find it, I jiggle a little bit to slide into the articulation. At that point, I hold the chicken with my knife and I pull out. One breast, same thing on the other side. Again, the articulation is right there. So I will cut, you go into the articulation, hold it, pull out. As you can see here, I have left the two fillets. Now I run my finger to remove that fillet there and that fillet here. And this is the whole carcass of the chicken. I've cut at the joint here, the joint here, the joint here, and the joint there. That's the fourth place where I have cut. This, usually, we cut the end of it. Could be this. This is a chicken for stew for four people, or four or more. Big breast. The fillet are left to cook with the breast, but more at the last moment because they are tender. And then the, the, the leg is usually cut at the, at the joint between the drumstick and the thigh bone. By cutting this, it makes it shrink so that as it starts cooking, it's going to shrink there and the bone will show. This is the chicken for stew. Now with this, what you can do here and after the articulation here, trim the side. I do the same thing in the other one here and there. And I will use this. Now I put that on the side, those two bones are here. I will go with the pull of my hand, push down on those bones, push down on this. Do the same thing on the other side. Push down on the bone here. Push down on this one, that's why you want to be after the articulation. So those bones are now loose. So I can remove them. Again, with my towel. Here. And then. So those two bones are out. If you have the opening here of this, you can have a garnish of uh, anything, meat or whatever. You may want to stuff it a little bit with a kind of meatball or whatever you have, and that make like a little balloon. And then you can poach those or you can stew those. Okay, so we have now the little balloon, or the ch little chicken balloon. We can do what we call lollipops. You, you grab this. Here with a towel, TV with a towel, so that it's straight this way. Put your hand there and break it down at the joint. Put your thumb in the back and pull. Those two bones will stick out. You remove the end there that you use for stuck. Using your towel, you remove one of the two bones, the small one usually, and you're left with one bone. And this, you pull this out a little bit to turn it inside out to do what we call a lollipop like this, that you can fry, or there is a different way of using it. It's often that a recipe asks you to stuff a leg of chicken, and often you buy it this way at the supermarket. But the way to do it is really to follow the bone. There is a thigh bone here, 
and there is the articulation, and then there is the bone of the drumstick. So you follow the bone on each side. This one, as you can see, after you go on each side, you could actually slide your knife underneath, scrape it a little bit, and then here, of course, you have to go around the articulation. Because here you have the knee around it, which is what I'm doing now. And now that I'm around the articulation, I can scrape it again. And I can actually leave the bone, take the bone out. Usually we take the bone out. So here is the leg of a chicken flap. And uh, whatever stuffing you have in it, let's say some round meat or whatever you may have, then you roll it on itself very tight, as tight as you can. And often, in terms of uh, cooking, what I do, I use a piece of plastic wrap on top. Get it really tight here, around. Roll it like a sausage. And often I put that in a piece of aluminum foil. And that goes into the oven, seasoning. Put into the oven, and after 15, 20 minutes of cooking, it's hard enough, halfway cooked, I can remove the aluminum foil and this and continue roasting it. You know, grilling or broiling a chicken usually goes faster than the roasting. And this is the way I do it. Usually I take the end here of those, uh, of the drumstick. You can of course do them with your knife, with this. I fold the wing underneath and I split it in half. It takes half of the time now to roast. Now I go on, see on each side of the neck here, with the point of a knife, I go through. If you feel you're not proficient enough with the knife, then use one of those to cut, as I'm going to cut on the other side here. Okay, that's kept for stuck. Now the secret of this, if there is a secret, is this. I really press it to have it. Mm. There is always a place where it doesn't cook completely is at the joint here. So what do I do? I do a little incision right in the joint. Same thing on the other side here, in the joint. The second place where you look that it's never cooked enough is between the drumstick and the thigh. Same idea here. I cut a little bit in between. You won't even see it. I do the same thing for a turkey. When I cook it like that, so the breast is not overcooked. And the heat has the time to go there and it's not red at the joint here. It's great to grill or to broil the chicken this way. You can brush the top with mustard, honey, ketchup, Tabasco, a mixture of all of those to make a beautiful hot crust. And it's a great way of doing it. And now the boning out of the galantine. Galantine or balotine. Galantine it's, if it's self cold, balotine if it's self hot. We have to remove the wishbone here. Cut on one side, on the other side, and here to, to have that big triangle here, which is the wishbone. I'm gonna cut the skin of the back now because I want to open the chicken completely. So that chicken has an articulation here and there, here, and there. That's the only place where I need a knife. The rest I'm going to pull. So first, let's move that up a little bit so I can show you the articulation there, I can feel it. Put my knife here, wiggle it, I get into the articulation there. Turn it, do the same thing on the other side. Articulation here. Now I've cut on both sides, so I can grab it here. I put my finger through it to hold it, and I pull out. Actually, I'm not really pulling out, I'm turning, I think this until I see the little oyster here. Change hand, same thing on, on the other side. I pull until I see the oyster. But here is the front of the chicken. The two fillets are still there. Put my two finger on the, on the sternum here and I go down until the end. On the side now, now that the second articulation, which is the oyster here, again, bring back the leg to crack it open. You can hear it crack. Cut through the large sinew and pull out. Same thing on the other side. I will cut the oyster, cut through the sinew and pull it out. That really should not take me much more than like a minute or so to bone out the chicken to that extent. There is the two fillet again left here. Usually I just run with your finger along the bone here to be able to remove that large fillet, the other one. 
and where I cut was that joint, and that joint, that joint, and that joint, that's it. You can see that that chicken here, the end of the sternum, the cartilage, chicken is like three months old. This is bone, it's a black bone. And two months later, it's going to be black up to here, up to here, up to here, and eventually you have a hand, and the bone is very hard at the end. Same thing when you go hunting, you get the sternum of the animal to know the age. Okay, now, I want to bone out the leg. All I do, I cut all around so that I'm able to hold it, and I start scraping. I scrape, this of course is the, the thigh bone. So I scrape the thigh bone, I could cut it at the junction, but if I cut it at the junction, I have nothing to hold it. So what I have to do here is really to cut all around until I have passed the articulation. Then I can start scraping it on the bone. And now that's it. I have the whole leg bone out. I'm here. I don't really want to cut the bone here because it shrinks in the boning process. So I break the bone with the back of the knife and remove it. After it's cooked, we trim this. Same thing on the other side. Cut around to be able to hold. This is all bone out. The only two pieces of bone are here. I can leave those in if I want to remove. I hold the bone from underneath. I have to cut all around the articulation. That's where it helps. And then push down. Even here I can see there is sinew still around. Sinew still around. And then I push down and remove the bone of the wing. Pull out. Now this is totally bone out. I have those two fillets. And you can see those two fillets have a long sinew inside. If you want to remove those sinew, which usually we do, you have to bring them to the side of the board and hold them with a towel, the way they slide. Keep your knife flat on top of it, and I scrape it out, you see? And the whole sinew stay there. I will bring that back and put it where there is no meat around here. Put a bit less meat here, so I cut a little bit of that meat here and there. And now it's about the same amount over. What do I do on top of it? Salt, pepper, and a stuffing. I have all kinds of different stuffing. In that case here, I have spinach. The spinach are sauté. With a little bit of garlic, you can. You can stuff it with meat, with rice, with... Uh, the only difference, the only thing that you have to realize is that when you use a cooked, a cooked stuffing inside, you don't have to worry too much about the internal temperature as much as if you put like ground pork meat, if you put ground pork meat, you have to be sure that it goes to about 160 degrees or more internal temperature. In that case here, I'm going to put some cheese and some bread. Kind of very homey, home type of a stuffing that should be plenty here. More cheese maybe on top. And that's it. We're ready to cook it. So, what you want to do is to bring back the side in the center here, nicely. Bring this one back again so we join. Gently grab it, turn it over. You want to be sure that that skin goes underneath here. This is reconstitute. See, there's a piece of skin which is cut here and there is nothing you can do about it. If you do a guarantee like that, when you go by your chicken, make sure that you check out a chicken where the skin is not already torn. And now we attach it. What you want to do is to make it very taut to the table to slide underneath. Attach it at the end, the two legs. And now you use that little loop. We call a half inch here, just like this. And you do that loop, you let that go, you grab it here again and slice it nice to the table. Then ease it in top to make it get as tight as this. Again, you have that loop that I bring underneath and continue turning here, here, and that's about enough to hold, so I could cut the string gently, I'll flip it over, try to bring the skin here, if you have a dressing which runs, you may put a little piece of aluminum foil, now I bring the string around so that it looks top and bottom, the same again, I bring it back to where we started, and we attach it right there. And we have now the poulet en sausage, you know, the sausage chicken that you call. Roast in the oven, you roast them around, you bring them, and 
Here is my galantine now. It's been cooked for a little while. As you can see, here even now you would want to remove the string finally now. And also cut those two legs that I told you not to cut to start with. I have a lot of good natural juice here. The leg. And that's it. My chicken. Whoop. Is ready to go. Take a clean knife here. Couple of the chicken inside the way it looks. If I use a natural sauce, just go on top of it like this. Sometime, you know, in the old style, you want to carve your chicken in the dining room and you will not need that you use again. The same place where we use it to bone out the chicken. Wrap one leg this way, cut the skin around, and you will crack it open. It will come off the carcass, in fact, much more easily than it did when it was uncooked. Again, now the other leg, you go into it, cut the skin around, and you crack it open. Now we go to back to the joint of the wing here, you cut a piece, again, grab it, and it will come out. We do the other side, and again, it will come out this way. I have not cut the breast in two pieces here. I have left a piece of the sternum here. If you can cut, remember, where the wishbone used to be here, you can pull it out, and again, that piece, the bone will come off the bone right there, and we'll, we will be left again with the same carcass that we had when we bone out the chicken. So, what happened is that we put it back there, take that piece of meat, yeah, to place back on the chicken here. You wanna take your wing here. You wanna place the other breast right there. The leg, the second leg. You want to be nice presentation, maybe with a nice bunch of watercress and chicken go so well together, and probably drip a little bit of your natural juice on top. And this is it: your simple roast chicken with a natural juice and watercress. Very often nowadays, you know, you go to large supermarket and you can find all kind of meat like this. This is a whole fillet of beef, complete fillet, also called the tenderloin. It's about close to six pounds clean. There is a big layer of fat here. I bet you with a layer of fat untouched would be about seven and a half pounds, quite a large one. So what you want to start pulling out on the silver skin, and that came, it came with what we call the shen here. That thing attached to it is the shen, and we want to remove that. So there is a lot of kind of a sinew inside. Not that you discard it, but what you can do is to spend some time on it. You know what, what I do, and uh, scrape it to the sinew like this. You can see all, the, all those sinew there. I scrape the meat of the sinew, and I do to form into great hamburger. Then there is still, as I said, a fair amount of fat, and underneath. Underneath the filet, this is the head of the filet, and underneath there is a layer of fat here, again, which is almost like the shank, you know, which kind of come out easily by itself. Now the filet, a little more silver skin here. I am going now, this is the head of the filet with that big knob. We separate it a little bit here because that silver skin kind of go inside a little bit. And we want to remove that silver skin. So you go with your knife this way, then you hold it, and you go. See, what you want to do is to really scrape, so you see the way I hold my knife, not flat, not this way, but slightly higher so that I can scrape again the skin, so I don't remove any meat with it, you know? So this is really, really tough, that silver skin. 
Now, often you roast a whole fillet like this, you will put the tail back here and attach it to the same thickness is throughout, so it cooked at the same speed. Or very often we divide it into different pieces. So let's say this is the top. We usually will cut the whole head of the fillet here, where that is, into one large. And that whole head is going to be done into a large steak. We call a Chateaubriand for two or three people. Here are what are called tournado, you know, and the tournado uh, in about eight ounces. We start cutting smaller pieces. We call it the petit filet mignon. We have the petit filet mignon. And then finally, often with the tail, we cut it into strip to do a beef stroganoff. Beef stroganoff is saute with sweet pepper. Saute like that, it's a delicious, it's an instant stew. You saute it and serve it rare. The petit filet mignon. Then the larger tourne d'eau. And finally, the big piece of meat, which often we wrapped. We wrap to make it stand up. Pound it into a chateau bouillant. You wrap it in something so you don't break the meat so much. So you will have a large steak here, which is going to serve three or four. Usually those are grilled or sauté. So, we have the ground meat that you do hamburger with. We have the petit filet mignon. We have the big tourne d'eau. We have the large Chateau Briand. And finally, the tail of the filet for stroganoff. I have a beautiful steak here. This is a strip loin or a New York strip. There is four or five names for this. But this is certainly the best steak and there is no meat like we have in America. This is cut to about eight ounces, you know, and I can put it down, pound it a little bit, and uh, I'm going to grill it. A dash of salt, a dash of pepper. Of course, I do a lot of my grilling outside, but I wanted to show you that it can be done inside. A dash of olive oil on top. And there is a special technique. It's not the only technique, but the technique that I use for quadrillage. So you put it on the side here, and that has to cook, depending how you like your steak, but certainly at least a minute before you flip it over. Tiny bit of uh, oil on top as well. So that is oil on both sides. Now the proper technique, I start from here and to go here. And after we'll go this way and this way. So now I'm ready to flip it. It should be marked, as my pan is really hot. So now, you see from here, I put it there. And the line are the opposite of this. You can flip it only twice. I like to flip it four times. I think that it equalizes the cooking from one side to the other, and there is no, the center, the exact center, are the proper color. And now, see, I will flip it so that it goes in that direction. Remember, from here to here, now this way. Here. And as you see, now the line will be in sync with this. Remember, this way, this way, now this way, and now this way. Set. That's it. My steak is cooked. You can see here the quadrillage. You can see here the quadrillage. One side, same than the other side. That's ready to be served for medium rare. I would usually put a little bit of herb butter on top of it. Tarragon lemon juice. Butter. Cracked paper. And that's it. Now as you see that steak should be about medium rare this way. This is the way I like it. Juicy, and with the redness right in the center of it. You see there is a certain amount more cooked here and there, but the redness is there. This is heaven. Really good. A new way of cooking today for young chef is the circulator so-called. So-called cooking sous vide because most of the things that you cook in there are under vacuum packed. I have short ribs here, which have been cooking 24 hours. It can cook up to two days, 48 hours at low temperature. And uh, the circulator itself is just water with that machine, which will keep an exact, exact temperature. I can cook eggs in it, as I have here, at very low temperature also, for like an hour, to have an excellent result. I have a sausage here, which is cooked in aluminum 
foiled. And I'm gonna show you how to do it. So here is the way I do that sausage. I have a pound of meat here, ground pork, a little bit of garlic, a little bit of garlic. I use some black chanterelle, which often they call poor man's truffle. It's a chanterelle that I, we find in the wood, and this one we are dry, and I reconstitute them in water. Some pistachio nut. Now the secret is to use a curing salt here. It's a curing salt, which gives you the beautiful red color that you have in hot dog, pastrami, corned beef, and so forth. Ground pepper, fair amount of ground pepper, and a little bit of white wine. You mix everything together. Your hand is the best tool to mix. And after you've mixed this, this should cure for a couple of days. In your refrigerator, it's fine. Now this is the same way you do a regular salami, and then you hang up and dry it. In that case, we're going to cook it. Or you mold it into a piece of plastic wrap, into a sausage, about two, two and a half inches thick, for a pound of meat here. Wrap your sausage and make it tight, as tight as you can here. You can roll it around nicely. You see those beautiful wild mushrooms there show through. Then you put that into a piece of aluminum foil. And again, it should be tight. Close the end of it. And this is it. After a couple of days, you drop it in there. And I cook that at 150 degrees there for about an hour, an hour and a half. And this is what I have here. I have a potato salad, which goes so well the potato salad with a sausage and here is our sausage here that you will cut into beautiful slice and as you can see with really a beautiful color because of the curing salt nothing better than a sausage poached like that and served on a bed of potato salad with mustard olive oil garlic in it This is a beautiful leg of spring lamb. Beautiful, about three and a half, four, four, five pounds, depending. This is the whole leg, except sometimes it comes with the shank bone here. This is the articulation of the femur, and you have the shank bone on top. So you have to remove it. This has been removed. This is what we call a gigot in French, and this is the classic, classic type of Sunday meal, you know, where you cook your gigot, taking a, li a little bit of the fat. You'll see that the fat is mostly on the hip part of it, have a certain layer in the the fat of the lamb is very saturated, strong, so you tend to remove it. What I'm doing here, very often we make hole in it like this, and you put a clove of garlic or a piece, a sliver of a clove of garlic, a little bit all over, salt, pepper, maybe a bit of rosemary, thyme, and that's it. You roast it in the oven and cut it right on the bone. However, I want to show you how to bone it out. That boning out is the same thing with veal, which is be about 50 pounds, and of course with beef, which is even larger, the muscles are the same. So next to this here, you have that piece of meat. I'm going to start opening here and pulling out. As soon as you see the separation of muscle, this is it. This is what we call the top round. You can see that as the muscle separate, you can see fiber you know, in between. So you just follow those. See, I'm following that here. This is the largest muscle of the leg. Here it is. And this is the top round. What do you do with it? You do a little roast. You can even cut steak out of it. If it were the beef, then you would remove a thin skin that we have on top, which in fact I can do it. Usually you don't do it with the lamb. We call that the blanket. And of course on the, on the beef, it's going to be much larger than that. Now you continue boning out. It's really a question of following the bone here. So you have that bone at the end of the femur, and you have the articulation of the knees, and it goes down. Often, you will find those legs of lamb also totally bone out, ready for you to put in the barbecue. I will continue cutting, following the bone on each side, on each side, and this one, you can see that this is the shank, piece of meat which is very moist, great to do stew with and now i have my bone here very often like i said you have the whole thing including the top round which we have been here 
and that you roll it together and make a rose. Here I have separated the top crown. I continue here, we can see where it's separate. You can also see that there is that piece of the knee, I mean the cartilage here, and that's why this one is called the top knuckle, that muscle. At the end here, where we add more fat on top of it, this is probably the choicest part of it in some way in terms of tenderness. This is the top seal loin. The top seal loin you can do a stake out of it. It's part of the hip and that's very, very tender. That's one, as I said, which separate here. There is also in between, like here, some connective tissue, connective meat, and that is used for, you know, to uh, stew or to ground it, to do merguez, for example, which is a, a lamb sausage. But I would use those piece for. This would be the top knuckle. As you can see here, this is where I had the shine. You can see those fiber. Again, I pull this out. And this is the shank here that you buy. And the shank, as you know, it's very tender, very moist for a stew, not to roast. So this is your shank. And those two pieces of meat left that I have here is the bottom round. And the bottom round is divided into two pieces, the eye round and the flat. In the center of that, there is always a large piece of fat here. People always used to say you have to remove it because there is a gland in the center. And it is true, you can see there is a gland in the center, but I don't think there is anything wrong with that. Here, that long piece, you see narrower, is probably the toughest part of the leg, and this is the eye round. If you remember when you do a roast, you have an eye round, and that eye round is a long piece of meat like this, which is pretty, pretty tough, and that type of meat is usually never roasted. It is used to braise. And the other part here of the bottom round is called the flat. And if I had to do a, a top round, I think I would take that piece over the other, remove some of the silver skin. And that basically it. Here is the bottom round. So the division of this is the top round, the bottom round, which is divided between the eye round and the flat, top knuckle, great roast, the shank for a stew, and the top seal on the hip, the most tender part. That, of course, is much larger in the veal, but the division is the same. Now, the kidney, they come from the animal all encased in that envelope of fat. You can see here, so you have to remove this. Unfortunately, as you can see, this one is cut here. They're all cut because it's the USDA, the meat inspector, you know, who come and cut each one of them to check for disease. So in, in one way it's good, but they should have a better cut than that. So we want to remove that at the end. Conventionally, when you get them, you would cut them, you would split them open to grill, for example. And after that, you will have to remove that skin. You know, on the outside here, here, and there, all around. So that they are completely clean. Now, if you want to saute the kidney, you will open them in the same way, except after they are open like that, you will cut them completely and remove that center part here, here and there. That's it. And the rest of the kidney here is cut into pieces saute with mushroom, usually with mushroom, sometimes a bit of white wine, red wine, that's standard. For the skewer, you go with your skewer on one side of the center, come back on the other side, and again put a bit of oil on top, sometimes you put mushroom in between, oil, and right on the grill. It's delicious. So here the rabbit, this is a young rabbit, three, four months, the color of the skin, the fat, and that will be tender. So this is divided into different pieces. I open the belly, it already has been eviscerated, but only the man guts, not the other part here. And you have to be careful because you have the guts here, which are full of uh, gut and bile, so you have to remove that, that's next to the liver. Beautiful liver here. On this side, you can see the kidney are in there, in their envelope of fat. 
and farther inside here you will have the lung which again we use in the stew see the lung will have that color what I like to do after that is to clean a little bit the inside and then we divide the rabbit the two back legs are going to be used together Now what happens in those two back legs here, you have to cut between the two legs to crack the bone. Actually it's easier from this side to crop that bone here and open it because very often at the end of it there is still the end of the intestinal tract. I want to remove here. Okay, now my leg is cut in two and usually four pieces two back leg now the front leg are cut at the joint you can see the joint of the clavicle here if you follow the bone this will be the front leg this is one of my favorite pieces personally because it's very very moist there is more bone but it is truly very moist okay this is all of the rib cage and we cut it to the beginning of the rib cage here. The rib cage is cut into usually three pieces. Okay. This is for stew, this is for stew, roast, and the saddle, what we call the saddle, the place where you sit down, we fold it underneath. This would be the loin in the beef, you know, three loin. That we roast separate, although you can also cut it and put it in the stew. So we'll have the saddle, the two back leg, front leg, near the neck, finally the, the liver here and the lung. And that's how you divide the rabbit in my kitchen. Stock is very important in the kitchen. Brown stock, white stock. The difference is that basically you take bone, put water in it, boil it, you have white stock. Take the bone, brown it in the oven, put water in it, cook it, you have brown stock. You reduce the brown stock, it becomes demi-glace or glaze. So there's all kind of uh, name, which basically the same product depending on the level of uh, reduction, level of intensity and so forth. Usually you don't put salt in stock because you never know where you're going to reduce it. This is a white stock, chicken bone, and I have already skimmed it, but I think it needs more skimming. I've already removed a fair amount of fat. And you remove what comes to the surface, scum, fat, and so forth, as much as you can. And as you can see it here with the ball of the ladle, I'm pushing it on one side and turning this around and picking up as much of the fat as I can. And I have quite a lot here. You want to keep it as clean as possible. And basically, by the time you strain it, you can leave it in the refrigerator. The fat comes to the top. And the day after, you remove whatever are hardened to the surface to remove the fat left over. And when I need it, I can reheat it. You want to strain it through a fine strainer, or double or triple mesh strainer. And now I'm going to clarify the stock, do a clarification, what we call a consommé. The process of clarification is the process by which you take a stock, which is kind of cloudy, and make it absolutely crystal clear. And it's done with a coagulant. When I was a kid, we still use blood, but basically, just like in wine, we use egg white now. You use green with that. And here I have the green of leek, the green of leek, the green of celery, parsley, and all that. You don't really need any big thing because it's not going to cook very long. And then my egg white, I have four egg white here. I put a little bit of water because the stock is hot and I don't want it to choke the egg white too much. I have peppercorn, and then I'm putting salt in it because there is no seasoning in my, in my stock. Now, if I have a stock which is not very strong, I will add like one pound, sometimes two pounds of ground meat here, very lean ground beef, to strengthen the stock. If I use ground beef, then of course I have to cook it for an hour and a half, otherwise what's the point of using the beef? I'm losing it. But if I, the stock is strong enough, all I want to do is to clarify it, then as soon as it comes to a boil, it boils a couple of minutes, I get the taste of tarragon, the green, so I can have fusion like a tea, then I can stop it and, and strain it. So from that stock here, now this is an interesting process because it doesn't seem, it seems that it gets worse and worse as you cook it. 
and it does to a certain extent, and all of a sudden it's like magical, it clarified. So this has now has to come to a boil. As you can see here, I've known people who throw out their consomme when it's halfway done like that because talking about clarification, because people think it's getting worse and worse and worse and getting totally muddy. This is the way it should be. Starting boiling on the side. So you have a raft, it's called a raft to form on top or a crust. And of course, as soon as it boils, last time you stir it, you don't want to disturb it anymore. And that's it. And I will lower the heat, stop the heat practically, not completely. Often I put it on the side like this, you know, so that you make a little hole. And it start filtering through that hole here. And you can see now already, except for the segment that there is in it the liquid is going to be very clear. So this is the ultimate soup, what we call the consommé. And I can let it set for five minutes and then strain it. If I want to do an aspic, an aspic is a consommé, but in the clarification, you mix some gelatin in it, unflavored gelatin, of course, mix in your clarification, and you do the same process. When it cool off, it hardens in aspic. The consommé is cooked now and ready to be strained. I'm going to strain it now. I wanted to show you the clarity of the consommé now through the little hole that I did, how clear it is. And remember the stock that I did it with, here is the stock, and here is the consomme there. You can really see the clarification. Now this doesn't even need to be strained, but to be sure we always strain it. And very often through even paper towel to make absolutely sure that there is absolutely no speck of anything in it. You don't really strain it directly in your serving plate. That's it. And here is my consommé, the ultimate bouillon. Crystal clear and delicious. The bread is the staff of life. It's always fun to make bread. I like to use, if I can get it, usually organic bread flour. And you can see that this one has proof. I mean, basically bread is flour, water, a dash of salt. You have to let it proof a couple of times. This one has been proofing. Then you break it down to deflate it. Then you use a bit of flour on this. And of course it can be shaped in any, any old way, you know, it's a question of uh, imagination and uh, So I'm going to cut a piece of dough for my baguette. Piece of dough for the AP. Other one can be made into individual roll. So what you want to do is to really try to tighten that dough, bring it back on itself a couple of times to make a seam underneath. Proof the dough to proof. You can even put a bit of uh, cornmeal underneath, which is a good idea for the crust underneath. If you want to do an AP here on this one, you can cut it with a scissor. You would go almost to the end of the bread and cut it like that to bring it on the side. Okay. And this, of course, has to proof before you can score it and put it into the oven. And very often, I put something on top like this to let it proof for an hour, an hour and a half before you put it into the oven. Again, when the dough has risen a couple of times, you can bring it on itself like that to give it more body. You know, turn it upside down, or you can do it from the top. The seam is always underneath. To prepare a large bread, what we call the gros pain, you know, the big bread, which is often what we do at home. Again, maybe a bit of uh, cornmeal underneath. This has body now. We put, put it there and it has to proof again. So cover it with something which fit, which will give space, space for it to inflate, 
and then when it kind of doubled in volume, you can mark it and put it into the oven. You know, when the dough has proofed again, it's ready to go into the oven. You can see this one when I move it like this, it's soft, it's nicely proof. I like to put a little bit of flour on top of it, even on this, give it a country look. And then I use a uh, serrated edge knife to cut through it. You know, like three times here, you can see. And on the baguette, again, four or five times. Usually where one line finish, the other one start. And when I put it into the oven, I spray a little bit of water in the oven to start the steam and start the crust, it make a thicker, better crust. The bread is still hot from the oven here, but you see it has a nice texture, it's aerated enough. And certainly the big bread here is really hard and the way it should be, but again, it's very hot out of the oven. Ooh, it's hot. I can't think of eating any meal without bread. I'm gonna make melbatos for you that people buy in store. This is a beautiful Pullman bread, and I cut thin slice of bread in the toaster. The Melba toast was developed by the chef Escoffier for the soprano Nelly Melba who liked her toast very, very thin, so he cut toast this way. Then you trim it. Actually, you don't even have to trim it. And when it's still warm, then you put your knife across here, from one side to the other, and it will separate into those two ultra-thin toast. This is what a real Melba toast is, very, very thin. If you were to try to toast a piece of bread that thin, it would curl up and burn. So you need to do what I'm doing, and even here, I will cut it even without removing the crust. And as you see, it works out just as well. This is the ultimate, ultimate sandwich with butter on top. And caviar. A nice black sturgeon, by definition, if you say caviar, it means sturgeon. If it's salmon caviar, it has to be salmon caviar or whitefish caviar or trout caviar. But if you just say caviar, caviar is sturgeon. From the small one, say riga to the ocetra to the other one. This is a really nice toast sandwich. You know, a sandwich of caviar with a melba toast. No when my granddaughter comes to see me in Connecticut, she wants crepe for breakfast. And I will show you how to make it really easy and very fast. Putting the heat on now, and by the time, I'm gonna put a tablespoon of butter in there, and by the time that butter is ready, my crepe batter is ready. I have about half a cup of flour there. The proportion are not very important. A tiny dash of uh, sugar, salt, one egg. I'm putting a dash of uh, milk in it. And then I mix it. You don't want to put too much milk to start with. I'll show you what, because you want the mixture to be thick. If the mixture is thick, like it is here, then the thread of the whisk can go through it and liquefy it to make it really smooth. What I mean is that if you put all the liquid in it, you mix it, you have nice little dumpling all over the place. Yeah. But now that it's thick like this, then I can put the rest of the meat a little more. I want a crepe batter very thin. If you have a crepe batter which is thin, you do very crepe, which we call crepe dentelle. Which I'll, show you. I'll show you what the crepe dentelle are. Now this is melted. I'm putting it in there, and I'm ready for my first crepe. That's it. Now the first crepe is usually for the dog, but the dog is not here today. Don't be afraid if you didn't put enough batter. I can always add a little more. Better to put less than more. So when you see getting brown at the edge here, I usually you can flip it, but sometimes it's harder. Probably this one hand and turn it over. This is the first side of the crepe. It's always the nicest one. First time. And what you do when it finish cooking, like it's close to finish now, I can flip it at that point. And I will slide it on my plate so that when I turn it, the first side, which is nicer, shows. Now the secret of a thin crepe is that you don't put it in the middle. You don't put your batter in the middle. You put it on one side and spread very fast all around. You see? 
I didn't even put enough, but doesn't really matter. I had more. Again, and you don't have to put any butter in between. Although Julia would have wanted me to put butter in between. She did. Now it's nice and brown. You see, I have one crepe when my daughter, granddaughter is there. She sits on the other side of the, of the counter. My daughter did the same thing when she was small. We have a jar of jam. She takes apricot jam and even chocolate. She grated it with one of those grater. You see, let's say I put too much in it. That's the opposite of what I did before. Then put it back in your pan right away. Of course, what happened here, you're going to have a lip. Doesn't really matter. You can always cut the lip and remove it. You know, this way, it's better, as I say, to put less than more. And this is not a crepe pan, it's just a non-stick pan, eight, eight, nine inches, whatever. Crepe pan often are very small, and I don't see the point. Sometimes I do it even on a bigger pan. So I give one or two per person. So again, as you see, the nice side will be here when I fold it. And that's all there is to make crepe. And now I will show you how to make crepe Suzette. Originally, the crepe Suzette were done at the table of the customer with lump of sugar that were rubbed into the skin of the orange. They become all orange because of the skin, the essential oil, and they were crushed in the pan with sugar and eventually butter and mixed with Grand Marnier and Cognac. We do it easier nowadays. I'm gonna put a piece of uh, butter to start with. And then use that miracle thing they had to do for the orange zest. Going a bit too fast there. And then now I'm gonna put the juice. Now let's see, I put sugar in there, because we want to do a caramel eventually, and then the juice of the orange, that is the base of the crepe Suzette. So here I have the mixture of sugar, orange juice, orange juice, all of this, and what you want to do now is to dip your crepes in it, and you want to cook them a little bit so they caramelize. So, you see what I do? I dip them on the side, then fold them in two and in two again. I'm gonna dip it this way and then down and in fourth. I'll do like four crepes at the time, which would be two portions here. Fold them here and in two again. Again here. I want to get the taste here. You see, fold it again and in four. And now I should have my four crepes in one layer here. And now they will caramelize. They should be pretty close now. I can fold it, yeah. Go on the and cognac. Move this a little bit. Don't look at it when you put the alcohol in it. And we will continue to slow there a little bit. Now you can get them one by one or fold them again. Well, I think the sugar is caramelizing a beautiful color here. Two, three, four crepe with a little bit of the caramel on top. But Usually you would not even serve them in a platter. You would go around and serve one crepe per person directly into a diner plate. And that's how I make my crepe Suzette. Yeah, there is nothing more useful and classic, in fact, than, than a pie dough. You can use it for so many different types of things. Sometimes I do it with butter and some lard, especially if I do like a quiche where you have bacon in it and so forth, and the lard really give it a great deal of flakiness. Often, however, I do it just with the butter. And when I measure the flour, I go directly into the bin like this and equalize it with a knife. Now, this is important because three cups of flour done this way is about a pound. If you sift that pound of flour, you'll probably have three cups and a half. That erase it when you sift it. So here I have a cup and a half of flour, a little dash of salt, a dash of sugar, that's it, and the butter. Now the butter here, I have about or five ounces of butter. And I could let it turn in the machine long enough so that the moisture in the butter will be practically enough to cohere the dough, get it together. If, however, I process it only a little bit so that I can still see the piece of butter, then I will have to add water. If I do that, I will have some of the flakiness, the flakiness that I get in a puff paste if the butter is still apparent. 
if I do it this way, you could see that if I get that dough here, I'm going to have pieces of butter all over the place. And that the principle of a puff paste, where the dough is separated from the butter, is the timing layer. So this is not exactly the same, but a little bit. So there I will put some water. And again, the amount of water depends on how much you incorporate the flour and the butter together. Here, probably like three tablespoons, three, four, let's see. Just a couple of false things this way. I want to grab it with my hand. I want to be able to hold it together this way. That's enough. So the dough is not completely incorporated, as you can see here, and that's what I want. I will get flakiness out of that dough. It will be tender and flaky. I'll get that dough together, and I can see that it's holding together, and that's what I want. And I will use, of course, a little bit of flour to roll it. Now, a lot of people tell you to let the dough rest. We know when you process it so minimally as I did, you don't really have to let it rest. Okay. Yes. It doesn't have much elasticity because I have not worked it out with the water. What I'm saying is that you can work flour and butter together and it doesn't get elastic. It's only by the time you put the water in it that it develops the gluten and it becomes elastic. The ultimate dough this way is a bread dough, water and flour. The ultimate dough at the other end of the spectrum is a cookie dough, flour and butter. This one is somewhat in the middle. I can see here. And I can see the streak of butter throughout. And I can see butter throughout here. What you want to do now, you want to roll your dough directly on your rolling pin and unmold it the other way. Meaning that this was the part which was on the table before, that is the part with the flour. There is no flour underneath. Now, edge it inside. You know, you don't. And usually you want to do a bit of a border with the dough. So what you do, you grab a little piece of dough and bring it inside so it gives you a bit of a rim. And then now you can cut the dough with your rolling pin one way and then the other way. Now you have that rim here that you want to press it so that it look nice and neat and, and the same all around. Okay, you can cook it this way, you can even mark it if you want with a little bit of a, with a fork or a knife all around if you want to get an edge. Now that dough can be filled up with apple or different type of fruit and cook directly or sometime we bake blind the dough so called that is a piece of paper you know, piece of paper a piece of aluminum foil sometimes it hold it some weight to cook it without anything inside and then finish it up after the pâte sucre you know, or the sweet dough is almost like a cookie dough it's done with butter one egg yolk flour and so forth and it goes very well in the food processor but i wanted to show you how to make it by hand or the technique there, so I have the stick of butter. I have two tablespoons of uh, powdered sugar here, a dash of salt. I'm going to start breaking this into pieces. And sometimes there is practically no liquid added to it, and that's why the dough is going to be tender. That's why the dough can be made thick. And even if it's thick, the heat goes through because the dough is porous. And because the dough is porous, that it's like a thick cookie, I'm going to add oh, maybe one tablespoon, maybe not even of water or milk. And then an egg yolk in there. Again, working the dough this way. I mean, the technique, proper technique for that is to bring the dough together and to crush it with the palm of your hand. In a technique we call phrase, you crush it so it's totally homogenized together, which of course is exactly the opposite of what you would want to do with a pot brisée or certainly a puff paste. This is a bit of a messy dough. You can add a little bit of flour and clean your finger with the flour. Okay. Then we're going to roll it like for a round tart. I can practically extend it with my hand, you see? A rich dough. And you don't do it as thin as you would do a pâte brisée, you know? Very delicate. about 
a circle like this. Again, the same idea. You unroll it. And now, you bring the side on itself to make to make a shell. I turn it on itself like twice. And again, the type of thing that you could not do, you would not want to do with, as I say, a pie dough because the thickness of dough will get raw in the center and will not really work. But the pâte sucrée will be like a cookie. You want to press it together to make an edge. And the way you want to press it, you want to have it like a, like a pyramid, you know, so that the top is pointed and the base is thicker so that it doesn't collapse on itself. And then to finish it up, you can press it this way with your index finger. And you can cook this like a large cookie and then fill it up with raspberry, for example, a bit of raspberry preserve in the bottom, fresh raspberry, a glaze on top. And that's a wonderful tart. And that keep a long time, several day cook like a cookie. It's a delicious dough. You know, puff pastry, but feuilleté in French, we call that thousand leaves because it goes into tiny leaves. It's probably one of the most challenging dough to do for the chef. It's made of a bread dough if you want water flour, which you spread, then you put butter onto it, you close it, you now have a layer of bread dough all around and a layer of fat in the center. That one, two, three, bread dough, fat, bread dough. You roll it into a rectangle, fold it in third, so it's three times three, actually eight, because where it touched the dough, it's still dough. And you do that six times and you have about 1,500 layer of bread dough and butter, which when you put into the oven, the bread dough, the water in the bread dough develop into steam. It's kind of waterproof by the butter and it's kind of developing into the multi-layer effect you have in Napoleon, Volovo and so forth. A pound of flour and about eight, uh, eight to 10 ounces of water, depending on the humidity. Okay, that would be my détrempe. So this is if you want your bread dough, of course, without yeast, actually. If you put yeast in it and you roll it like a puff paste, you have croissant. The croissant is a mixture of puff paste, if you want and brioche, that is, it's a, it's a dough roll like the puff paste, but there is yeast in it. Okay. So now we have to extend this. Usually you let it rest in between. There is about three or four different ways that I make puff paste. The classic way, the most classic of all, is really to do a square of the détrempe, then you have a square of the butter in the center and you bring the four corners together and you start rolling. Here I do it slightly different. It goes faster and I think the result is just as good. So I will extend that dough. Don't be afraid to use flour here at that moment, it's okay. into a long rectangle like this. So I have a pound of flour here, and I have like three quarters of a pound of butter. You can go up to a pound of butter, and I will arrange that butter on like, not quite to the end over there, about the equal amount on over. So what you do here, you bring back the third of the dough, which is not covered with any butter on top, and then you fold that against on top. It means that to a certain extent you already have several layers. So that gave you time. Okay. Now we give it the first turn. I can see that my dough is still rollable, doesn't have much elasticity yet. So I kind of break it down a little bit like this. The first couple of dough are the most important, that equalize the butter all over the place. You can see through the dough, those layers of butter here. Yeah. Now, it is the time to do the turn. There is two types of turn. You have a single turn or a double turn. You want to make sure that you have no flour in the center of it, so you want to brush it out. If I fold it in three, I go here Bring that here, that gives me three layers. One, two, three. That's a single turn. I want to do a double turn. We do occasionally, again, to go faster. I go in the center here. 
make sure that it's sealed nicely. Again, in the center here, brush it with any, any dough. Gonna make sure that it's together and fold it this way. This is one, two, three, four, rather than three dough. So it's actually one and a half turn. The puff paste should have six turns, six single turn, or if you want four, turn and a half. That puff paste is ready. One, two, three, four, five, six turn. You mark it so you remember it. Uh, often at the last turn here, we roll it in sugar to do like pig's ear or to do all kind of different dessert that you do. But the technique is basically the same way whether it's sugar or flour. So, here you can see that it's nice together. Dough is beautiful. So, let me take a piece of this. You know, it's hard to see the layer here, of course, because after a six turn, as I say, there is like 1,500 layers, but they are there. Okay, they can be rolled, as I say, in many different shapes. One of them certainly is uh, when you take this and you brush it with eggs and a mixture of paprika and parmesan cheese, you brush it on top to do cheese straw. Then you fold it, you know, so that you can cut it. Let's say one, two, just to show you. So this, you will have it to do cheese straw. You can have your cheese straw that you cook in your cookie sheet and at the end of it, when you eat them, remember now they're covered with one thing or another, you crush the end of it here and the end of it here so that they don't shrink. Another way is to do a sacristan. You take one this way, you put your hand here, your other hand here, and you do this. And that you have what we call a sacristan. And again, you cook them in a long way. You crush the end here and you crush the end here so they don't move while they are cooking. Another shape, which is pretty common, would be to do larger sacristan like this. Again, rolling sugar. You fold it in half. You cut it in the center, and you bring that here to cook it this way. I'm sure you've seen those shapes. Sometimes we even give a double turn there. You know, this way, and again this way, to turn it a couple more times. This. Now, when you want to do pig's ear, you can take a piece like that again in sugar. Roll it into your sugar. Fold this here one time, at least two times, to where we are here. One time, two times, there is place for another time here, another one here. Fold them in half. Now you put that in the refrigerator, the lug, and when it's nice and cold, of course, you cut it into those things that we call pigs here. You put them to be cooked on the tray and you twist the end of it. So they spread out because remember that the puff paste is now in that direction so it will spread out this way. If you want to do a tart, a square tart, which we often do, so let's say you want to do those type of cart, again you brush it with, uh, with um, eggs, you fold it in half like this and the type which is folded here, you cut it this way, the other one this way, then you reopen it, again brush it, you bring that part here that would be your edge, and that other part here, which will be your other edge to do a square puff paste tart, you know, some large ones, some small ones. Of course, there is the classic co called fleuron, you know, that we serve as a garnish to uh, many things, you know, certainly to fish, and that's the fleuron garnish, you know. These, of course, are rolled in sugar, all of those different shapes, and uh, baked on either parchment paper or one of those silicone non-stick mat. And this is a few things that you can do with a puff pastry. Meringue are easy to make, inexpensive, and are used in a great variety of dessert. Uh, you can beat your eggs, of course, by hand, but here, with the help of the machine, it makes it easier. And what you do, you have one cup of sugar pear for egg whites. Yeah. This takes a couple of minutes to go. I put 
my sugar very fast in it and I don't really beat it long after the sugar. The longer you beat it with the sugar, the more elastic your meringue will be, more like marshmallow. And you can keep it longer. However, when you cook it, it will be kind of elastic a little bit, like a marshmallow, which some people like. This one where the sugar is added very fast and just incorporated into 30, 40 seconds, the meringue is going to be very brittle and very soft, which I like. So we use a pastry bag here. Those are wonderful now, those in, in plastic, which are not reusable. You can fold it this way. And here, putting the, the tip in there. Should fit right here. If you don't want it to run when it's something more liquid, twist the end of the tip and push it inside so that nothing can come out of it. You want to fold the border so you don't get it all dirty all over. And then you can fill it up, of course. Now the technique here is going to be the same than when you do, you know, cream puff dough, for example, choux éclair saint honoré so it's a way of using the bag. When you have it this way, you fold it like an accordion. Then you put it there, and you will press with that part of the hand and direct with that part of the hand here. So there is all kind of shape that you can do. And then you turn it as you go along. So if you want the long one, the classic one is going to be long, you stop pushing, you stop, and you bring back up. You know, again. On the other hand, sometimes you want like a teardrop so you don't move the end of the bag, you apply pressure, and then you pull out. More this way. Uh, sometimes you just want to have a small meringue this way to do one thing or another. One thing that you should know is that when you use the pastry bag, here, for example, I basically touch. When I want to do a strip, a wrong thing like a Saint Honoré or whatever, then you keep you know, the pastry bag away so that you can direct the shape that you have. If I were to touch the bottom of it, then I will have problem. This is a tuit d'amour we call, you know, a love nest that you fill up a meringue like this. Sometimes you put another strip on top. You can do it this way to get that type of shape. And you can also then use the fluted edge here to use it this way. As well as round one. Now you want to put a bit of powdered sugar on top of it. Let's give it a nice glaze. And then I cook my meringue around 250 degrees. I start. And then I stop and lower it at 230 in those area after like an hour and a half, two hours. It takes two, three hours to bake. It is. And here it is ready to go into the oven. And here is cooked meringue. As you can see, this is slightly beige in color, and I like it beige in color. I don't like it when it's totally white. Some people want it white. You have to cook it at lower temperature. You can see that this is very dry. If I break it, it breaks and very crunchy. Not marshmallow like at all. An old classic dessert. This is how you make meringue. Something as simple sometimes as slicing a genoise in different slices can be tricky. You know, you can use uh, a guide like this if you want to so put your knife flat on top of it and go through so that you know that the slice is equal thickness. You don't really have to. What you have to do is to start on one side, here, say the top, and you see what happens is that people tend to try turning around. You don't move your knife, you just turn the cake. See, I'm turning the cake here so that eventually I'm back in the first slice that I started and I'm across. Again, you know, I will turn my cake. Again, to fall again in the same slice. And that's all there is to it. Usually you will start putting your cream. This is the top of the cake. You will put your cream in between and uh, that one which is the bottom of the cake is always flatter to finish your cake this way. I always melt my chocolate in the microwave oven. But don't put it on like three, four minutes, it will scorch. You put it on one minute, you wait for a while, put it back on another 30 seconds or so, and that's one of the best way of doing it. And one of the easiest desserts is using the leaf from the outside on the side where you have the, you know, the vein of the leaf. And you can brush it with chocolate, just as I'm doing here. 
and that's it. You put them on a rolling pin or in something with a shape, like what I have here. That's it. And you put them in the refrigerator. Ten minutes later, they look like this. You can peel out the chocolate and on the side of the where you have the marble leaves here. And this is a very simple, great dessert, which the kid would love, absolutely. Here you are. Make sure that you use edible leaf or something which is not poisonous and something which hasn't been spread, it's better. One of the best ways to temper your chocolate so it stays shiny is to melt about three quarters of it either on top of a double boiler or in the microwave oven. Then you put the rest of it, grate it on top, stir it, and that will temper the chocolate. When nice decoration is relatively easy to do, you dip this into two or three or four like petal, you know, around. And then you put that directly onto wax paper like this so it cool off in the refrigerator. And that make a nice cup that you can fill up with ice cream or with berry or with things like this. So that have been in the refrigerator for a while, you know, to harden them out. And now, let's see if those things come out. Very often they just pop out and too, and sometimes they give you a little bit of trouble. Like those seem to Depend on the temperature of your chocolate. Here is your chocolate cup that you can now fill up with ice cream, raspberry, strawberry, and the like. You know, it's great with berry like this. And of course, the nice bowl of ice cream like this inside. Maybe a little spring of mint. That's a beautiful dessert. You know, in candy making, or even a pastry chef, the cooking of sugar becomes very important. Different degree, different use. Often we cook the sugar into unlined copper. Anything you put in unlined copper acidified, like you beat egg white in unlined copper. And when you don't have unlined copper, you put an acid in it. A pinch of cream of tartar, tartaric acid, or a few drops of lemon juice, citric acid, a couple of drops of vinegar, acetic acid. Any of those tend to work, but if you use the copper like this, then you don't use anything in it. It has the same. The same reaction. So basically you start with sugar and then we can put water in it, all water, or sometimes a little bit of water. And many chefs prepare to put a bit of caro syrup, you know, which is glucose, so called in it again to prevent crystallization. You just you just want to stir it enough so all the sugar is wet, and that's it. You don't want to stir it anymore. When it's cooked, you don't stir it. In fact, sometimes on the side of it, there is crystallization. Sometimes we put a lid on top of it, and it gives you some, uh, some vapor, I mean some moisture, and it melts a bit of that crystallization. So now I'm going to put that to cook. Now let's see. It's still a white caramel, but I think there we are at the half crack. Watch out with that cold water, be careful, grab some, and go back in there. It hardened right on it, and you can see a little bit of tinge of yellow here. That caramel is hard. This is hard crack. If I crack it, just explode between my teeth. This is hard crack. I have a blonde caramel here, and I want to thicken it a little more. So if you put it in water and ice, the bottom will thicken quite fast. And that's what you want. Now the bowl is oiled, so even sticking, try to go around. Whoop. I want to go from one side to the other. And as it cool off, it should shrink a little bit to come out of the bowl. Again, it has to cool off. Give it time. That's it. Plug it in there. And now to do angel air. A nice way of doing it like that is to do it with a whisk. You cut the end of it so you can grab it. And uh, what I have here. So what you want to do there, you want to get a piece of wood and spread. Okay, so 
This is the way you do angel hair. And the point is that when you have a little bit of the bee wax in it, then it doesn't, it doesn't glue together. You can gather it into a kind of nest like this, you know, to put it around a satinery cake or something right on top of it, a hat of angel hair. So whether you do it on the outside of the bowl or the inside, you want to pry it out a little bit. It does shrink a little bit as it, uh, as it cool up. So it should come out and it makes a nice, you know, decoration for a swan in, uh, in cream puff dough or a little cake. Birthday cake is great. And as I say, in between those, you can put some flowers or herbs. Looks great. I certainly hope that you enjoy my technique and you're going to use them to cook for your friend and your family. Happy cooking. <laughs>